Okay, magic. All right. My name is Brandon Lewis, and um, I did my project on structural alignment and the resultant knee conditions in the female athlete. And a, a little bit of background information of why I chose to do uh, specifically the female athlete. Um, women, uh, there's been research done that suggests that women are 25% more likely to sustain a knee injury as compared to men. Um, several studies conducted have been conducted to evaluate why this is the case. Um, one done by McKeon and Hartle showed that females demonstrated uh, larger quadricep angles or Q angles, which is what I'll refer to it throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, more genu recovatum, greater anterior pel pelvic tilt, and increased femoral antiversion compared to males. Um, and then also another study showed that uh, genu recovatum and navicular drop had the greatest impact on anterior knee laxity in females, and lower tibiofemoral angle was also a significant predictor for joint laxity. Um, I did this because after uh, spending some time working with the female soccer team here, I realized that there were several athletes that either complained of chronic uh, knee pain or would have some type of knee issues. Uh, some specific people come to mind when I think about uh, what inspired me to do this, but I got to wondering what, um, what predisposes one female um, to sustain a knee injury or uh, to suffer from chronic knee conditions as compared to the same, um, a female of the same basic build, weight, playing the same sport, um, is there something structurally there that predisposes them to that, or um, is it just pure happenstance? Um, when I started looking into the research uh, to see which direction I wanted to take with this, uh, that really narrowed down what I wanted to focus on. Uh, from the time that the first research study was published in 1996 that detailed men and women uh, had a significant differ difference in uh, knee injuries and how they presented, uh, research seemed to take that specific uh, sex-related path and focus mainly on, well, why is this difference between male and females here, and what is the difference, and um, they, that had been the case for a long time up until 2008. Um, there was a research retreat held in Greensboro, North Carolina to evaluate where we were at with research in um, the field of orthopedics slash uh, physical therapy, athletic training, to see uh, where we needed to go with the research to make progress. And um, they came up with three important themes. Um, one theme being that there needed to be a, a clear working definition of a non-contact ACL injury uh, due to the fact that um, research had, you know, been skewed a little bit of what people were um, saying was non-contact versus um, what actually was non-contact. Uh, that also the, the time to move um, beyond the pure descriptive sex comparison studies which had been done, uh, they said that it was critical to examine the underlying causes of the knee injury instead of, sp of the differences in just male and females to figure out what the problem was so that we could correct the problem or prevent it. Um, and needed a more integrated approach uh, to risk factor assessments versus the uh, continued examination of isolated factors being whether it was muscle difference between the quadriceps and hamstrings or um, you know any, any biomechanical factor that might limit that as opposed to um, what is actually affected when they're playing on the field. Uh, so the purpose of my study was to evaluate the correlation between structural alignment of specific anatomical landmarks and the incidence of uh, knee conditions in the female athlete. And I figured that I would see a direct correlation based on the research that was out there already um, a 
of what predispose both males and females, um, that I would see a direct correlation between specific angles in certain females being greater or less and um, those being the females that suffered from some type of knee condition. My subjects for the study, I originally started out with a large subject uh, group and because of time constraints I limited it down to 25 and then due to lack of participation it got cut down further to 12 um, which is uh, seems like for this study was a, a sort of small population. Uh, it, was, it was composed of 10 women's soccer and two women's cross country athletes between 18 to 21 years of age um, and I split the variables up into independent and dependent based on their, their preseason questionnaire that I administered um, and the way they answered the questions on the questionnaire being as based on their um, previous injuries, their chronic knee pain that they felt like, you know, on a daily basis do they have knee pain. Um, and I, I let that determine whether they were going to be the uh, independent group or the control group. Um, and it basically came down to six and six. Um, six athletes had sustained um, knee injuries previous to the study, and six athletes um, had no history. So that turned out to be a, a good uh, addition to the small sample size, I guess. The materials I use, I handmade an apparatus um, and I base this off of what's called the digital photographic measurement <coughs> method. Um, and it had been shown to have high validity and reliability, so I thought it would be you know, quicker to take pictures of the athletes as opposed to measure them out each individually and then um, measure the angles compared to those pictures. So I made the apparatus based on uh, specifications that each athlete could stand on uh, with their feet comfortably apart and mark specific points on their body so that we could use a digital camera, take a picture of that. We kept a plumb line in um, the picture to get a true vertical um, in each shot that we took. So I administered the preseason questionnaire to get a look at uh, where they were at as far as injury-wise. It also assessed their height, um, their weight, and whether they had any current illnesses at the time. And then we marked specific landmarks. Um, I say we, but I did the majority of the marking myself. Uh, I marked uh, the ASIS, PSIS, um, their knees, specific angles on their knees, and their ankles and feet to assess their arch, uh, the transverse axis of the knee. Uh, we obtained several different images. There was 10 images per athlete. Um, and it came down to, we, all, we actually only needed three of those images, so uh, that's all we ended up using for the assessment. And then the athletes were followed through the remaining uh, portion of their season to assess uh, each, each time they had an injury or a knee complaint. That was recorded so it could be correlated at the end of the season. Uh, these are the, the measurements um, that, we did for, that I did for each picture. Um, I measure the Q angle, uh, the A angle, which is uh, a measure of the transverse uh, axis of the knee based on the joint line, uh, apparent leg length discrepancy, um, and apparent leg length of each uh, individual leg, and then pelvic obliquity, which is uh, the relationship of the left and right pelvis and their angle, which should be at zero. Then uh, I did I measured uh, the navicular height and based on the truncated foot length. It's called a truncated navicular measurement, which is, uh, gives you a good assessment at where their arch falls, whether they have fest planus or cavus. <clears throat> Ultimately, the results that I got all together were there was no significant correlation between my results, which was definitely not what I expected to find, but this could be due to time constraints, the sample size that I had, uh, measurement error on my part, whether it was, you know, uh, I was a little bit off on the palpations, or uh, the software, which wasn't necessarily uh, affordable for a college student <laughs> if you want a good software. So, 
Um, I ended up using a lower end software that could have, you know, had some error and had to be calibrated several times. And then these are the the measurements that I got. I listed those. The only uh, two knee injuries are highlighted in bright colors that we've seen throughout the season, and there was no real significant uh, factors that could attribute to that. And this, I put it in uh, a different kind of graph so you could see just how scattered it was. Um, pretty much every graph looked this scattered, so I tried to fit it in one that you could see everything at once. Um, as I said, my results showed no significant correlations. Future research should definitely be done into this uh, with a larger sample size and longer study duration, better measurement software for sure, uh, one that does all the work for you so you don't have to do all the ratios and such. <laughs> Not really a question, but I think that was an excellent study, and I really do think that if you had a larger, you know, time period, maybe like a larger population, that you, I don't know if you still would have found something or not, but I definitely think that was a really good study. Are you going to appeal to get your research um, extended somewhere? I know you work in the office that conducted research. Will you appeal to I'll possibly to continue your research? I'd like to, yeah. I think that you definitely see a correlation um, over either a larger sample size or a longer period of time, uh, a chance to see more than just you know two injuries out of twelve people. So you can definitely answer a lot of questions, or not at all. So I think it's definitely worthwhile doing. There, there's a lot of data out there, and you're right. Your um, your hypothesis is definitely correct. There's no question. There's a correlation. Um, in particular, you, you're obviously I think the biggest thing you had the problem with is just twelve. 12 kids, which is way too small. And what you probably would have done if you really were to set your study right, you would take those, take those 12 kids and the six that had a history of previous injury, exclude them. Don't make them controls, exclude them right off the bat. So if you take that, now you're down to six. So that's way too small a number. But there's there's multiple data out there now that shows that there's no question there's a correlation between particular foot malalignment and no, knee injuries in particular, but they've narrowed it down a lot more even to ACL injuries. ACLs in, in female athletes, obviously that's a hot topic. There's no question it's increased incidence. You know, people surmise everything from um, obviously increased Q angle. Uh, there's been a good study now that showed that obviously one of the things is, is a lot of female athletes don't have the benefits of like male athletes playing sandlot sports since they're, you know, up until, you know, several years ago. Just girls just didn't have access to it. And so there's an idea that they don't have a lot of training they don't have like a little muscle training that, that guys would have to. Obviously, it's always thrown in the hormonal thing. Anything you see that has women in particular, their hormones always get thrown in there. Um, whether it's a big component or not, it's hard to say. But there's a big study now that shows that big study, I'm talking thousands, that incidence of uh, ACL injuries compared to menstrual cycle, is, there's no question there's a correlation. Right. So you got to figure there's some kind of hormonal thing going in there too. But like I said, it's, it's an excellent study. It's a good idea. It's a great idea. And the only thing that really hand tied you there was that you just didn't have enough people. Did you exclude uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome as your uh, as a condition? Any condition I, I of that or did you not consider it? Um, no, I would have considered it. Uh, you know, we had some female athletes on the soccer team uh, that would probably have been good candidates for that to be in the research, but uh, they just didn't show up for the questionnaire as a measurements or anything, so I had to throw it out.